Good. All right. So today I want to I want to start um, what is effectively the next section, well, the first section for this course, and that is um, on um, ordinary differential equations. Now, you might wonder why are we thinking about ordinary differential equations again? This is certainly something that you would have um, encountered from very early on in your in your undergraduate career, even probably first year in M1000 if you're at UCT, or the equivalent if you're in any of the other universities. So differential equations is the bread and butter of physics. It's the bread and butter of, of, of applied mathematics. Why are we thinking about this again? Well, the reason we're thinking about it again is because as we develop further, we'd like to develop more and more sophisticated tools for solving these differential equations. You know, this, this, I hate making jokes on Zoom because, because I don't get any response and then it feels like you, you make a joke and it's like crickets, um, but I'm going to make the joke anyway. So this illustrates, you know, the utility of these things for, for mathematics and physics. Um, you know, there was a, there's a story of, of, uh, of a uh, research institute in Mexico, which after many years decided, you know what, they wanted to make things more efficient. And the way they would make things more efficient is they would bring in uh, somebody who had business expertise and they would run the research institute, this, this physics research institute like a business. So they brought in this person and the person said, okay, this is how we're gonna run things in future. Um, every Monday morning, all the, the different uh, groups are gonna come together and they're going to tell me what they were planning on doing um, for this week and on Friday afternoon, they're going to come together and they're going to tell me what they did this um, the, over the last week. And the way they're going to do that is to is to um, produce this big report. So Monday morning, the the director of the institute has to show up at my at my office with a report for what they're planning on doing. On Friday, they have to show up with a report for what they already did. This is how it works in business. This is how we're going to make this place more efficient. So obviously, the theoretical physicists were very perturbed by this. They were quite agitated that they had to produce these damn reports Mondays and Fridays. So the research, um, the theoretical physics research director said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. So Monday morning, he goes to the meeting. Friday afternoon, he comes back from the meeting. And suddenly, the theoretical physicists are not required to, to perform this exercise anymore. So somebody went to him and said, what did you do that you managed to get us off this meeting? And he said, well, on the Monday morning, on the first Monday morning, I showed up with a report this big that said, these are the differential equations we're planning on solving this week. On Friday, I showed up at his office with a report this big, and I said, these are the differential equations we solved for this week. They never asked me to do it again. So differential, see what I mean when I, when I say you'd say a joke on Zoom and it just goes flat? Um, laugh differential equations in thanks, uh, Cabello, <laughs> much appreciated. Um, differential equations are really the bread and butter of uh, physics and of applied mathematics because they tell you about how systems change and really understanding how systems change um, is what we do on a daily basis. Now, that said, solving a differential equation need not be the same kind of solving the differential equation that you did in first year. Right. As we develop, we develop more tools and we would like to apply these tools to solving these kinds of problems. Well, I hope that when you guys were in at least second year, you learned about how to think about differential, um, about derivatives, the differential, the d by dx as a differential operator, as something that operates on um, an entity to produce something else. So today I want to start a small journey um, and we're going to illustrate this with ordinary differential equations. You can certainly do this for partial differential equations, but as you can imagine, things get much more complicated. So we're going to think about ordinary differential equations again in a more abstract fashion. And that more abstract fashion is going to be built on the idea of, um, on the idea of operators and thinking about differential equations as operator equations. Um, well, another type of operator that you would have encountered is um, in, in matrices, when you learned that a matrix acts on a vector to produce something else, another vector sometimes, some, another matrix sometimes. And by analogy, when we learn to think about differential equations as differential operator equations, 
we can recast the idea of an ODE as an eigenvalue problem. Now, you may have encountered this in the past, you may not have thought about it this way, but when you encountered the idea of sturm liouville um, systems, that is exactly what you were doing. You were recasting a differential equation as an eigenvalue problem. <clears throat> um, this eigenvalue problem, solving this eigenvalue problem is unfortunately a fairly difficult task in general. Fortunately for us though, there are various special systems where you can use special tricks. Um, one very special system, which if you've been taught by me before, then the kind of mantra associated with my lectures is that if there's nothing you learn out of your time as an undergraduate doing courses in mathematics and applied mathematics, learn about the harmonic oscillator. It is by far the most important system, physical system that exists, okay? It is the ideal laboratory to learn about many, many things. Um, and we're going to try and understand how to use the quantum version of the harmonic oscillator, which is really an operator equation, um, to discover a kind of trick to solve the harmonic oscillator, the quantum harmonic oscillator problem, without actually solving the quantum harmonic oscillator differential equation. So those of you who have done physics, I think at least in physics two at UCT, um, you will have seen the quantum um, harmonic oscillator problem. You will have solved the quantum harmonic oscillator problem and you would have seen how difficult it is to solve the, the quantum version of the harmonic oscillator. So we're actually going to do this in um, some detail and we're gonna do it relatively quickly. And you're gonna see if we can pose the problem as an eigenvalue problem, um, how much easier it becomes, okay? Any questions? So if not, let's get started. I want to start by <clears throat> revisiting the idea of um, just some basic facts about differential operators. So let's start by revisiting some basic things about differential operators. Well, the first thing is I should tell you um, about differential operators is, and in fact, I want to talk about linear differential operators in particular. The first thing I want to say um, about these operators is that is, is to define, um, well, is to tell you why having self-adjoint operators um, is important. So the first thing is, let's remember, let's recall that if I have an operator, let's say a differential operator, uh, let's call it T, is, that is, And here, the important property is that of self-adjointness. So if I have a differential operator T that is self-adjoint um, with respect to a particular inner product, with respect to um, So an operator T that is self-adjoint with respect to some inner product um, has the following important property. The property that we're interested in is that it has a complete set of mutually orthogonal eigenfunctions. And the important words here are 
complete. And orthogonal. Okay, so if I have a if I have a self-adjoint operator, and I should tell you what self-adjoint means if you don't by the way, how many of you don't know what self-adjoint means? Is there anyone who does not know what I mean by self-adjoint operator? Okay, so everybody's familiar with the concept, right? Anybody no. familiar with the concept? No, I'm Warren. Not yes. Yeah, I'm not uh, familiar. Okay, so if there's at least one person who's not familiar. Let me. Let me just um, refresh your memory. Um, okay. Um, in fact, let's do it this way. So the operator T is self adjoint if I have an inner product between phi and let's say t psi, and that is equal to t phi inner product with psi. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay. So um, you can see what's important in this is the idea that there is a uh, that there is an inner product. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, when I take the operator T from its left action on Psi and I move it to the right, normally that defines for me the adjoint operator T dagger. And if T dagger is equal to T, then we call the operator self adjoint. In other words, if Phi T Psi is the same as T Phi Psi, then it's self-adjoint, okay? So important, the important point here is the existence of the inner product. So sometimes you can have um, operators which are self-adjoint with respect to one inner product that are not self-adjoint with respect to another inner product. And it's important that we can show that we can find an inner product for which it is self-adjoint. Once that is true, once I have a self-adjoint operator with respect to some inner product, then I'm guaranteed, <coughs> excuse me, and I'm guaranteed that I can find a complete, um, I can find a complete mutually orthogonal set of eigenfunctions. Everybody happy with that? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. In addition, the set of um, the set of eigenvalues of the operator T is called the spectrum of, um, of T. So, and I denote it normally by sigma of T is the set of eigenvalues, um, generally complex, such that T phi is, well, let's call it psi because that's what we're gonna be using, T psi, is lambda psi, right? And this is what we call the spectrum of the operator.
Yeah. In some um, in some textbooks, you might notice that um, that they call it spec of t. Yeah, it's much of a muchness. We're going to call it um, sigma of t. So sigma of t is a set of all eigenvalues um, of um, of the operator t, and it, it constitutes the spectrum um, of of the operator. Um, spectra so, of operators can either be continuous or discrete. In particular, an eigenvalue is called, yes? Uh, could you please uh, scroll up a bit? The last bit that you're writing, you didn't kind of see it. It was blocked by oh, the sorry. panel down here. Can you see that now? Um, still can't see the last bit. What do you see? I, I see on my screen sigma of t equals a set of lambda and c such that t psi is lambda psi. I only see the zoom panel, the one that has participants chats and whatnot. Um, if you, at the top of the panel, there'll be three options, like a flat line, like a square, two flat lines, and then like a cube of like three squares. Just click the one with the flat line. Uh, yeah, I am on the flat line. Sorry. Sorry. You're not seeing my shared screen, is, is that correct? No, I can see your shared screen. The last point, however, is uh, hidden by the panel that oh, contains I see. I see, I see. mute start here. Uh, you can move that around. So if you move it to the top of the screen, then you shouldn't be able to see it. Or you just drag it to the side of the screen, you shouldn't be able to, to, to it shouldn't block you. I think for me to remove that, I just click on the screen with my mouse. I think that does it for me. I don't know if that helps. No, it doesn't help on that. I'm gonna just go, just go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good. So let's see, where were we? Um, okay, so an eigenvalue is belongs to the discrete spectrum if the associated eigenfunction is normalizable. In other words, it's a square integrable function on some interval, okay? So an eigenvalue lambda um, belongs to a discrete spectrum. if um, it's associated eigenfunction is normalizable. In equations, this means that the eigenfunction psi is a square integrable function on whatever interval um, we're talking about. So uh, this notation here means that um, the integral of mod psi squared dx from a to b is finite. Everybody happy with that? Yeah. Good. Cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> If this is not the case, right? So if t acts on some functions on, um, on, a, on a finite interval, 
and the eigenfunctions fail to be normalizable in the sense that if I take their square, in, uh, their, if I take their mod squared, integrate it over that finite interval, and it comes out to be infinite, then in that case, the associated eigenvalues are said to belong to a continuous spectrum. So the difference here is the discrete spectrum has normalizable wave functions or eigenfunctions. A continuous spectrum has uh, non-normalizable um, uh, eigenfunctions. Um, there are some examples, like the famous example of the hydrogen atom, whose spectrum is partially discrete and partially continuous. Okay. I want to focus a little bit to start off on, on just the discrete um, spectrum. So suppose, um, suppose I have a discrete spectrum. So in the case of a discrete spectrum, the following is true. <clears throat> so by definition, my operator T acts on some discrete set of eigenfunctions, psi n say, and let's say we're talking about one dimension. So the psi n's are a function of x. And this will give me some set of eigenvalues lambda n psi n of x. And the key point here is that because my spectrum is discrete, these labels n are integers. Okay. Now, I assumed that T is self adjoint. And I'm going to make an additional assumption that um, I have non degenerate uh, eigenvalues. So, what does that mean? That means that. So if I'm assuming that T is self adjoint with, sorry, with non-degenerate eigenvalues, This means that, um, this is what non-degenerate means. It means that if I've got two eigenvalues, lambda n and let's say lambda m, then unless m is equal to n, these eigenvalues are not equal. So lambda m and lambda n are not equal to each other if m is not equal to n. Okay, so I'm going to assume that I have um, a self adjoint operator with non degenerate eigenvalues. So, what does this mean? Well, what it means is that what it means is that if I take, let's say, phi m in a product t phi n. And I subtract from that T phi M in a product with phi N. Then I know that this guy, T acting on phi N, by definition, is lambda N phi N. And this guy, T acting on phi M, is lambda m phi n, uh, phi n. In other words, the first term is going to give me a lambda n. The second term is going to give me a lambda m. And in both cases, I'm going to get a phi m in a product phi n. Okay. And because T is a self adjoint operator, 
the difference of those two must necessarily be zero. So what do we have? We have this equation that lambda n minus lambda m something times the inner product of phi m and phi n must be zero. Well, <clears throat> by my assumption, since these are non-degenerate eigenvalues, lambda m and lambda n, unless m equals n, are not equal to each other. So this quantity here is necessarily, um, sorry, I'm not sure if you guys saw that. This quantity here is necessarily non-zero. So if the product of these two things is zero, the only way that's going to be true is if these guys are zero, right? But of course, um, I have to account for the case of m equal to n. And in that case, because I have normalizable wave functions, this means that the thing that must vanish here, um, well, not vanish, the thing that must equal to the conica delta is this phi m in a product phi n. And I'm going to take the opportunity to define um, what I mean by the inner product. And what I will mean by the inner product is phi m complex conjugate of x, phi n of x integrated with respect to x. And this thing is necessarily equal to delta mn, otherwise the relation above will not hold. Okay. Now, it's not necessarily always true that it's equal to delta mn. It could be some additional factor, but I can always choose to absorb that factor into the definition of the um, eigenfunctions, in which case, for some suitable scaling of m, I can always make this to be true. Can everybody follow my logic here? Yes. Correct. Sorry, if I may ask. Yeah. Is it safe to assume that non degenerate? It also means that phi of n and phi of m are non zero. I'm sorry, say that again. Is it also safe to say non, -degen non degenerates also means that phi of n and phi of m are non zero? You mean phi subscript m and phi subscript n are not equal to zero? Yes. yes. No, actually, that's, that's, that's not the same as non degenerate. But that is my assumption that I'm dealing with non vanishing eigenfunctions. Otherwise, everything becomes trivial. Okay, good. So, uh, Matthew. I'm sorry, Professor. Um, are we assuming that the eigenvalues are all real? Because, um, because I'm not assuming a, that the eigenvalues are all real. Shouldn't you get a conjugate um, lambda m if it's acting on the bra? No, I'm just calling it lambda. So it's not the same. It's not the same. It's not. It's not, I'm not getting, my definition here is that if it's acting on the bra, it's acting on the cat, I'm still gonna just call that lambda. Okay, and then a follow up question. Doesn't, yeah. a, self, doesn't a, a emission operator imply you have real eigenvalues? A emission operator implies that I have real eigenvalues, yes. But self adjoint is not the same as emission. It is in, in some cases, but it's not always the case. I'm just being more general here. Okay, then maybe you can, can you tell me what the difference is? After the lecture or something. Yes. Oh, sure. Or... Sure. Um, uh, okay. So there's one more point that we need to to elaborate on, and this is the idea of completeness. So completeness in this case of the eigenbases means, remember I said that if I have a self-adjoint operator, I can always find a, um, if I have a self-adjoint operator, I can always find a complete mutually orthogonal basis, right? So I told you what mutually orthogonal meant. It means um, precisely this relation here, that if I take the inner product, I get the chronic delta. And what self, what completeness means is that um, if I take the psi n's of x and multiply it by psi n of x prime, 
take the complex conjugate of that, and I sum over all the n. This gives me the Dirac delta function, delta of x minus x prime. Okay. So this, in turn, gives us a representation for the Dirac delta function. Sorry, that went too fast. Does everybody have that? Anyone that's writing, um, taking down notes. Um, if you're not and you're listening, I'm going on to the next page. Can I move on to the next page? I've written okay. it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. So, what does this what does this mean exactly? Well, <clears throat> um, what it means is that if I take this guy, f of x prime and multiply it by delta of x minus x prime, then what I will find is, what I will find is that I can use the expansion to write that as the sum over n phi n of x, my function f of x prime, phi bar n of x prime, by our representation of the Dirac delta function. Um, and so, I can follow this on with the statement that if I write f of x for some function f of x, you'll recall that the property of the Dirac delta function is that this f of x was what I get if I take f of x prime, multiply it by the delta function, delta of x minus x prime, and then integrate the whole lot over x, over whatever, over x prime, sorry, over whatever the domain is, right? Um, and so this in turn is the sum over n by my expansion that I've just written out, phi, n of x. I can pull this out of the integral because it's dependent only on x and not on x prime. Integral of f of x prime phi bar n of x prime and the whole lot integrated with respect to x prime. And you can see that this has the form of the sum over n of some set of coefficients, a n, which don't depend on x, are constants, times phi n of x. So these guys, the a n, are just constants. And they're not any old constants. They're constants that I get by um, they're constants that I get by taking my function evaluating it at x prime, multiplying it by phi n bar at x prime, and then integrating with respect to x prime. And you can see, because I've integrated out the x prime dependence, they're just constants. They're the coefficients in the expansion. And this is my eigenbasis. Question. Kenesa, you're unmuted. You have a question? Oh, no, sorry. Okay. So the upshot here is that any function, if I can expand the delta function in the phi n basis, then I can expand any square integrable function in that same basis.
Okay. So as I said, though, solving the eigenvalue problem, you know, even if I could take my differential equation and I could formulate it in this eigenvalue problem, it's still hard to solve the eigenvalue problem. However, in some cases, um, I can actually solve the eigenvalue problem by resorting to tricks. Um, one case, one such case where I can I can do this, and it's a it's a very special case of where I can do this, is um, in the quantum harmonic oscillator. So what I'd like to do now to finish off today's lecture is to do an example with the quantum harmonic oscillator. Um, and show you what I mean by such a trick. It's actually a trick that's well known to physicists, um, but they tend to not think of it as uh, as a as a as a trick, and it's often given a more um, uh, elaborate name of the method of uh, raising and, and annihilating operators. But the point here is that we want to pose the problem as an operator problem. Okay. All right. So the quantum harmonic oscillator um, is defined through the following differential equation. Um, in fact, let me not say it in terms of the differential equation. I'm going to say it in terms of the Hamiltonian, which corresponds, which, um, uh, okay. All right, okay, let's, 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 the problem is defined by the Schrodinger equation. Um, that looks like this. And I'm going to strip away all the bells and whistles in this problem. There's H bars, there's a whole bunch of other things that, that are floating around in here. Because we're approaching the problem like mathematical physicists and not theoretical physicists or even experimental physicists, I don't care about all those other things. I just want to extract the essence of the problem. So the Schrodinger equation is an eigenvalue equation which says that the Hamiltonian acting on some function, which we call a wave function um, is equal to the energy eigenvalue multiplying that function. So this here is called the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is a differential operator. Sometimes you will see a hat on top of this thing to indicate that it's an operator but no hat up here to indicate that it's a number multiplying it, but it should be clear from the context what we're talking about. Um, and so I'm not going to do that, but this here is the energy of the wave function. So this is the energy or energy eigenvalue. And this is the eigenfunction or wave function of the particle, say. So. Okay. In the case that we're interested in, the, I, the Hamiltonian H is equal to minus d by dx squared, which I'm going to write in the shorthand notation, partial x squared plus x squared. Okay, so partial x here is what I mean, and it should be familiar notation, but it's what I will mean by d by dx 
like that. So the whole operator then becomes D2 by DX squared. Are we clear? Yes. Okay, great. Well, the first thing you would notice is that this is a second order operator. There are squares floating around. Okay. The fact that there are squares floating around tells me that I might have some hope in factorizing this quadratic operator. And in fact, there is, and in fact, I can, and I can factorize it into minus dx plus x times or acting on dx plus x plus one. And the way you would do this is the way you would always do this, these things when you're working with differential operators is you act on some test function and show that this is uh, that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are the same thing, okay? But in case you're not familiar with that, let me leave this as an exercise for you to check for yourself. Oh, sorry, it's a horrible color. Turn that off. So check this and convince yourself that it is true. We're going to be doing lots of operations like this um, going forward. It's important that you make sure that you are that you understand um, how that works. Okay, <clears throat> so I can take this quadratic operator and I can factorize it into um, two linear operators. So there's no, there's no squares floating around in this guy. And it's clear that this is of the form, um, this is of the form, Q dagger, Q plus one. So my statement here is that there's an operator Q, which is dx plus x. And the adjoint of that operator is Q dagger, um, which is minus dx plus x. How many of you are not familiar with finding the adjoint of an operator? Would anybody like me to find, to show you how this works? Yes, please. Okay. So whenever I make comments in, in green, they're always asides, except for the beginning of the lecture where I outline what we're going to do. Um, in the lecture itself, if, if anything's in green, um, then this will be an aside that's, that's elaborating on a specific thing, okay? Uh, yellow will be comments. Um, sometimes red, red will point to important things or problems for you to solve, and blue will be examples. So this is the aside. How do I know that um, Q dagger is what I claim it to be? So suppose Q is dx plus x. Then if I've got two I can, if I've got two wave functions, psi and phi, then phi uh, q psi is equal to um, phi bar q acting on psi integrated with respect to x. But <clears throat> this is also equal to the integral of phi bar um, dx plus x acting on psi dx by the definition of what q is. And that's equal to integral phi bar dx psi plus phi bar x psi, all integrated with respect to x. There's nothing particularly interesting with the second term, but the first term has the dx acting on psi, 
Now, if you remember what we said about when something is adjoint or not, I have to bring the action of the operator onto the left-hand side. So the way to take the action of this guy from here onto here is an integration by parts. So I integrate by parts and I'm going to assume that everything's perfectly kosher with respect to the boundary conditions and I can drop the boundary term. So I'm only going to throw the derivative from the right to the left. And when I do that, it comes with a minus sign. So that's equal to the integral of minus dx acting on phi bar. And then I will have the psi. Okay. Um, yeah, then I will have the psi, and then there's a plus x times phi bar, and all of this multiplies psi, and I integrate with respect to x. Okay, so the action of the of the derivative there is just on the phi bar. Well. By definition of our inner product, this is just Q dagger acting on phi in a product with psi, which leads me to conclude that Q dagger must be minus dx plus x. Is that clear? Yes, I have a question about the previous slide. Okay. Um, I'm just confused where the plus one comes in for the check. Uh, where the plus one comes in. Oh, good. Okay, the, the plus one comes in precisely because we're working with operators and not with just um, straight up numbers. So again, let me invite you to take the right-hand side, the factor part, Take the left-hand side, act on, act with both of those on some test function, call it f of x, and see that they give you the same thing. And you'll see precisely where the plus one comes from there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? And so you have your hand up. Is that an old hand or is it new? Oh, sorry, that's an old hand. Okay. Okay, so that was the aside. So let's get back to the computation. So, okay, clearly then our Hamiltonian is, the, is of the form Q dagger Q plus one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what can we say about that? Well, suppose, suppose instead we switch the order around. Suppose I want to switch the order around. And instead of considering uh, Q dagger Q, I will consider Q Q dagger. So let's see what Q Q dagger is. So Q Q dagger, instead of Q dagger Q, acting on some function psi, is, you will remember, who asked the previous question? Was that Georgie or about the plus one? Oh, yeah, it was me. OK. so. Here, this will give you an idea of where this is coming from. Okay. Um, Q, Q dagger acting on psi. Okay. Well, this thing is dx plus x. That's the Q operator. The Q dagger operator is minus dx acting on psi plus x times psi, okay? So now let's act with the second um, 
differential operator. That's going to be minus dx squared. That's the dx acting on the minus dx on psi. Then the dx acts on x psi. So um, first term comes from here. Second term comes from here. So the dx acts on x psi to give me just a psi. But by the product rule, it's also going to have to act on the psi in the x psi combination. So that will give me an x dx psi. And then I have the x multiplying things. Let's use a different color for that. Um, so x multiplying this and x multiplying that. So that's equal to minus x dx psi plus x squared psi. And I can see immediately, by the way, does this answer the question of where the plus one comes from? Uh, yes, I think so, thank you. Okay, so it comes from the product rule is the upshot of the, okay. So what, I'm, what am I left with? I'm, X, I'm left with this term. I'm left with this term and I'm left with this term. So let's pull out an overall psi from, from all of these on the right. And if I do that, I get minus dx squared plus x squared plus one psi. Okay, where did the one come from? The one came from the fact that I have this x psi term and I'm acting on it with the derivative operator and I have to account for that um, from the product rule. But minus dx squared plus one, well, that's just the Hamiltonian. acting on psi. In other words, we conclude then that while from our factorization, the Hamiltonian was Q dagger Q plus one, the Hamiltonian is also Q Q dagger minus one. Okay, so it's Q dagger Q plus one or Q, Q dagger minus one. So <clears throat> suppose now, so th these are two important points that we need to, that we need to make here, right? The Hamiltonian is either this guy or this guy. And we're gonna use both of these facts now. So how are we gonna use both of these facts now? <clears throat> well, Suppose I have some eigenfunction that's an eigenfunction of Q dagger Q with non-vanishing eigenvalue. So suppose that psi is an eigenfunction of Q dagger Q with eigenvalue lambda, and I'm going to impute, uh, I'm going to assume that lambda is not equal to zero. What can I do with that? Well, sorry. Then the following is true. Q dagger Q psi is equal to lambda psi by our definition. 
And now I'm going to act on the right-hand side with another Q. So that means that Q, Q dagger Q psi is equal to Q lambda psi. But lambda is just a number, right? So I can exchange it with Q. Q is the only operator and operators don't commute in general, but operators and numbers commute because that number lambda is lambda times the identity and the identity commutes with um, any of the operators. So, so what? Well, um, <clears throat> if I move the brackets around, this tells me that Q Q dagger Q psi is equal to lambda Q psi. Well, that tells me that if psi is an eigenfunction of Q dagger Q with eigenvalue lambda, then Q psi is an eigenfunction with the same eigenvalue of the operator Q, uh, so, uh, of, yeah, of Q, Q dagger, okay? So Q psi is an eigenfunction of Q, Q dagger, with the same spectrum. Possibly with the caveat lambda equals zero because I necessarily excluded lambda equals zero from that uh, by construction. Um, and so, you know, if I'm saying they share the same eigenvalues, they share the same spectrum, then I need to be careful that there might be something going on with the zero eigenvalue, okay? Um, <clears throat> so the question then is, does Q dagger Q have an eigenfunction corresponding to um, eigenvalue zero? We call this in the literature zero modes, right? Does it have a zero mode? And the answer is actually yes. So the answer will turn out to be yes. And how exactly it turns out to be yes, I will cover in uh, Thursday's lecture, okay? Any questions? So let me leave with that question. Does Q um, dagger Q have a zero mode? Which is an eigenfunction with lambda equal to zero, because our little statement above might go wrong there. Okay, any questions? Okay, so we'll finish this up on Thursday then.